Hypotonia is a common diagnostic challenge that presents in the neonatal period. The presence of hypotonia may signify an underlying systemic illness or an abnormality of the central or peripheral nervous system. The term floppy infant is reserved for infants presenting with generalized hypotonia presenting at birth or very shortly after birth. These infants have decreased resistance to passive movement. The hypotonia may or may not be associated with muscle weakness. Muscle weakness in the neonatal period can be recognized by carefully observing spontaneous anti-gravity movements in the limbs of the baby. It's important to recognize the various presenting features and early clues in an infant with hypotonia. Very early on, hypotonia in utero can present with reduced fetal movements. A floppy infant will also have a problematic delivery where you will have abnormal presentations such as a breech presentation or transverse lie, failure to progress due to the absence of primitive reflexes in these babies and frequent C-sections. Another important presentation, early presentation for neonatal hypotonia is arthrogryposis. Arthrogryposis simply means multiple congenital contractures. And you can see in the two pictures provided in the slide, two infants with contractures involving the elbows with flexion contractures in the upper picture, flexion contractures of the knees, and equinus deformities of the feet. After birth, common presenting features include poor respiratory effort and with prolonged respiratory muscle and diaphragmatic weakness, the development of pectus excavatum. The presence of a poor suck and swallow are also common presenting features of neonatal hypotonia. These children will present with choking and if asked, mothers will endorse that milk does leak from around the mouth while feeding. There is a standard procedure for the examination of the hypotonic infant. Examination and assessment of tone in infants is an important component of the examination of all neonates. Infants with hypotonia may assume a frog-like position. Frog-like position implies that both knees and the lateral aspects of the thighs would be touching the bed at the same time. There is a standard procedure for examination of tone. This includes examination of head lag and observation of the traction response vertical suspension, and ventral suspension. Head lag is maximum at birth and is secondary to weak neck flexors of neonates that gradually acquire strength. By the age of three months, head lag should be minimal. In between birth and three months, head lag gradually decreases. The traction response is seen through flexion of the knees when head lag examination is performed and implies trunk muscle strength. With vertical suspension, 
you should be able to suspend the baby with only your thumbs under the axilla, leading to flexion of the, of the elbows and flexion of the hip joints. Hypotonic floppy babies will slip on vertical suspension. With ventral suspension, the baby is suspended on the abdomen on the examiner's hand. A floppy infant will have a C-shaped back. The normal response to ventral suspension is extension of the neck and extension of the hip joint with straightening of the back. The following two slides are a demonstration of tone examination. The second slide is a demonstration of a hypotonic infant. This is the characteristic C-shaped back encountered in floppy infants with ventral suspension. You can appreciate the curved back and the flexed hip joints. Hypotonia in infancy is significant. It can indicate a pathology in the neurological system at the level of the central nervous system or the level of the peripheral nervous system, cerebral hypotonia versus motor unit hypotonia. The differential diagnosis can be quite extensive and a methodical approach based on the clinical presentation of the infant is crucial to arriving at a correct diagnosis. Various pathologies or insults along the motor pathway in the neonatal period manifest as hypotonia. When the pathology involves the brain or less commonly the spinal cord, an upper motor neuron or central hypotonia picture is seen. Whereas any pathology involving the anterior horn cell, peripheral nerve, neuromuscular junction, or muscle will manifest as a lower motor neuron hypotonia. The most important initial step in the diagnostic algorithm of neonatal hypotonia is the distinction of a cerebral hypotonia pattern versus a lower motor neuron hypotonia pattern. The most important clue to the diagnosis of cerebral hypotonia is the presence of abnormalities of other brain function, such as the presence of seizures or the presence of poor visual tracking. Additional features as listed include dysmorphic features, excessive fisting of the hands, malformations involving other organ systems, the presence of robust, strong anti-gravity limb movements is strongly suggestive of a cerebral hypotonia, the presence of normal or hyperactive tendon reflexes indicating a healthy motor unit are also suggestive of a brain pathology. Additionally, scissoring on vertical suspension implies the development of spasticity of cerebral origin. This combination of trunk or central hypotonia as evidenced from excessive head lag, C-shaped back, and slipping on vertical suspension, coupled with the development of limb spasticity can sometimes be confusing for practicing physicians. However, this combination of central hypotonia and limb spasticity is characteristic of cerebral origin neonatal hypotonia. On the other hand, the absence of tendon reflexes, failure of movement on postural reflexes, and poor anti-gravity movements, in addition to the presence of signs such as fasciculations 
muscle atrophy, and the absence of abnormalities of other organs are all strongly suggestive of a motor unit hypotonia. The differential diagnosis of cerebral hypotonia could be quite extensive. It includes any insult to the developing brain. Cerebral malformation, CNS infections, including acquired infections or congenital torch infections, can all present with hypotonia in the neonatal period. Chromosomal abnormalities, should be considered in the presence of dysmorphic features, such as trisomy 21 or Prader-Willi syndrome, for example. Hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and inborn errors of, in of metabolism usually present with, hy with hypotonia after the first 24 hours of birth. The evaluation of cerebral hypotonia usually starts with a brain MRI. Brain MRS or MR spectroscopy could be added for evaluation of metabolic diseases. In the presence of dysmorphic features or a family history of hypotonia and cerebral malformation, genetic testing such as simple karyotyping or more advanced testing such as chromosomal microarray or whole exome sequencing should be considered. A metabolic evaluation is usually considered in the presence of metabolic disturbances, fluctuating mental status or fluctuating findings, and the appearance of hypotonia after the first 24 or 48 hours of life. Metabolic evaluation includes simple metabolic labs such as electrolytes and liver function, and more advanced metabolic labs such as urine organic acid, serum amino acid, or lactate. For the most part, when available, metabolic evaluation has been largely replaced by genetic testing for inborn errors of metabolism. This is one example of a congenital brain malformation that frequently presents with hypotonia. You may appreciate in this MRI image of the brain the absence of the usual gyral pattern. This congenital brain malformation is called lys encephaly. A basic understanding of the levels of the motor pathway can provide a framework for the methodical approach to the differential diagnosis of hypotonia of lower motor neuron origin. And while anterior horn cell diseases such as spinal muscular atrophy and congenital myopathies and muscular dystrophies commonly present with neonatal hypotonia, diseases of the peripheral nerve are quite uncommon. Pathologies of the neuromuscular junction include neonatal myasthenia gravis. This is seen when the mother has myasthenia gravis, autoimmune myasthenia gravis, with passive passage of autoantibodies to the fetus, resulting in neonatal neuromuscular junction dysfunction, or congenital myasthenic syndromes, which are hereditary diseases resulting from mutations of genes encoding proteins for the function of the neuromuscular junction. We'll end this lecture with a basic discussion of spinal muscular atrophy. Spinal muscular atrophy is an autosomal recessive disease that results in degeneration of the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord. It results from a deletion or a mutation in a gene, the SMN1 gene, the survival motor neuron gene on chromosome 5. There is variable severity and phenotypic expression of spinal muscular atrophy. 
This variability in severity and phenotypic expression is related to the SMN2 gene, which may partially compensate for loss of the SMN1 protein. The higher the number of SMN2 copies, the less the severity of the disease. For example, in the most severe types of SMA, SMA type 0 or SMA type 1, there may be no SMN2 copies or only one copy, whereas in SMN, SMA type 3 or even 4, you may find four or more copies of the SMN2 protein. The clinical features of spinal muscular atrophy are the typical features of a lower motor neuron hypotonia. There is significant flaccid weakness of the limbs, absent or decreased deep tendon reflexes, prominent tongue fasciculations, and muscle atrophy with reduction in muscle mass. Arthrogryposis may be seen with time in relation to development of weakness of the diaphragm and respiratory muscles, pectus excavatum may develop. Spinal muscular atrophy is unfortunately a progressive disease with increasing weakness as the child or infant grows. Ultimately, dysphagia, dysarthria, and significant respiratory weakness develop. With early onset neonatal hypotonia, SMA type 1 is on the differential diagnosis when an infant with a lower motor neuron type hypotonia is encountered. Werdenig-Hoffman disease presents from birth to six months. As mentioned, it is an autosomal recessive disease with the classical floppy baby presentation of a lower motor neuron origin. Symptoms are progressive and are quite rapid at times. Unfortunately, the majority die before one year of respiratory failure and repeat respiratory infections. The investigation of choice for the definitive diagnosis of spinal muscular atrophy is genetic testing. The management of spinal muscular atrophy has long been limited to supportive therapy. However, recent advances in genetic therapies have led to approval of a specific disease modifying treatment, intrathecal antisense oligonucleotide, which increases the expression of the SMN2 protein through exon skipping. And while the efficacy of this disease-modifying genetic treatment has been definitively demonstrated, it continues to be prohibitively expensive and unattainable in most parts of the world. The most pressing immediate issues in an infant with hypotonia pertain to feeding and breathing. Inquire about weight gain, failure to thrive. Inquire about choking and whether milk or food comes out of the nostrils and about evidence of aspiration. Also inquire about milk leaking outside of the mouth during feeding. Respiratory complications can be related to respiratory and diaphragmatic muscle weakness and also be re related to repeat aspiration pneumonias. These infants may require G-tube feedings 
and may require home oxygen or BiPAP non-invasive ventilation. Certain communication issues are worth mentioning. Please avoid a judgmental demeanor during your evaluation process. Some infants are significantly floppy. Please avoid showing surprise or astonishment towards the degree of hypotonia and weakness. Please be mindful that parents may have feelings of guilt or denial. Feelings of denial can lead to parents denying their child the appropriate medical care, such as G-tube insertion or assisted ventilation at home. Assess support systems for these parents in cases of lengthy admissions to the hospital, which are frequently required for these infants. 